Good morning. Let's get started. We have two panels today, uh, packed, interesting panels. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is our second day. I see a few people that were not here yesterday. Uh, yesterday we had four fantastic panels, um, a very funny, entertaining, but also informative keynote uh, speaker, Mimi Sheraton. So we're excited to continue our conversation today. Uh, before we start, um, let me say a few things about what we do here. Uh, my name is Fabio Parasecoli, and I'm the director of Food Studies Initiatives here at the New School. Uh, our Food Studies program started in 2008, and now has developed in a, into a major, a minor, and starting from the fall, an associate degree. And we're also working on new programs at the undergraduate and graduate level, both here and in Paris. And uh, you'll know more about it as we uh, roll them out. Uh, as in the tradition of the new school, for us it's very important to maintain uh, a communication and context and a, a close relationship with the community and New York City, hence also the, the theme for this conference. So, we have a series of public events. This is part of that. And if you're interested, you can leave us your email and we'll make sure to keep you informed of what we do. Um, we have a couple of events coming up. One in September is gonna be a panel on food and technology organized together with MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. And in November, we're gonna have a three-day uh, conference. It's the inter second international conference on food and design. Uh, so if you're interested in, in this, let us know and uh, we'll send you all the information. Um, many of our food studies courses at the undergraduate level are open to the public. And this is also very important for us. It brings great diversity uh, to the classroom. So. Um, you're able to sign up as a continuing education student. But we try to reach out to people all over, so we have also launched a couple of uh, open online courses, which are free. Last year we did the first edition, uh, and we had more than 1,500 students from all over the world. So we're very excited to roll out the second edition this year. It will open April 20, if you're interested to sign up. Uh, you can go to Canvas, it's our platform, so canvas.net, and look for Innovators of American Cuisine. That's the title. And then in May, May 18th, we roll out the second uh, called Writing American Food. Um, last but not least, we have a website called The Inquisitive Eater, inquisitiveeater.com where we accept submissions from anybody, not only from people from the university, and uh, we accept uh, written text, poetry, nonfiction, videos, photographs. We really uh, hope that it will become an interesting and stimulating place for exchanges about food. So I'll finish with the thank yous, which are necessary and really, really, really well deserved from the depth of my heart. Um, I wanna thank the, the deans, the, the dean of the, our division, Mary Watson, and of our school, Laura Auricchio, for, uh, for their support. And a special, fantastic, I don't know, infinite thank you to the um, organizers of the panels. Um, many of them are here. Uh, Roseanne Gold, uh, Andy Smith, Kathy Kaufman, and Thomas Forster. They have made an amazing job, and if the uh, conference is as successful as it is, it's thanks to them. Um, many other people worked uh, on the logistics and the organization. B. Banyu, the chair of the undergraduate program in food studies. Pam Tillis, who's right outside, uh, the program director, Brandon Fisher, Maeve McInnes, who just entered, uh, uh, Grace Yang, uh, Brett Silvers, uh, and all the student workers. And of course, I have to mention our sponsors, uh, the James Beer Foundation, the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation, and our food and drink uh, sponsors, Irving Farm Roasters, you've tasted their coffee, Bridor, 
for the baked goods, juice press, nuchas empanadas, or washers, uh, VS Imports, and Bruce Coe's ginger ale. And now it's my duty and my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the next panel. I don't know where to start, honestly, because, you know, Andy Smith has published, I don't know how many books, I've lost count. Thousands. Thousands, <laughs> we've been, we've told. I just want to mention that he's on faculty uh, at the new school and he's been on faculty for, for a long time, long before I, I came on board. And if the program is here, it's also uh, be because of his work. Um, oh, here's 26 books, see? And uh, these books include New York City, a food biography, and he's the editor-in-chief of Savoring Gotham. Uh, sort of an encyclopedia of food in New York City. So I think it's the perfect person for this panel. And Andy will introduce the speakers. Thank you. My, my first visit to New York City was in 1960. Uh, can any of you, uh, were any of you around in 1960? A few, a few of you are raising your hand. Uh, as a 14-year-old, we, we went to a large number of eateries here, and, but as a 14-year-old, the, uh, the only eatery that I can remember is the Automat near Times Square. And, and now, if you're over uh, 40, you will understand what an Automat is. For the rest of you, um, an Automat, at least this one, had just solid uh, wall of, of machines that you plunked in coins to and you could open up the doors and they had food behind it and so you could order whatever you wanted. I don't know why this was the memory that I have of my first memory of eating in New York City because we ate a lot of really good places, but that is it. Uh, when I moved to New York in the 1970s, of course, I had a wonderful pleasure of eating at many different places, but it was in 1991 that the Automat closed. Um, it was uh, the last Automat closed. It was purchased, uh, the, the whole Automat chain was purchased by the franchisee for Burger King, and Burger King opened up restaurants in the Automat stores. Um, and when that last Automat closed, it was a feeling from my standpoint that this was something New York City lost. Um, and it was something not particularly unique to New York City and Philadelphia, but it was something that I thought was unusual and something very important. It was, the, it was the event that uh, I began to collect material about New York City. And so for the next 15 years, I collected a huge amount of notes. I have over a thousand pages of notes on uh, eating in New York City and food in New York City. And I concluded that my thousand pages of notes were in fact a very small percentage of the things that have been written about New York City. Um, by my count, I, uh, there are at least um, a thousand books written about New York City food, or at least have large sections of New York City food and beverages in them. There are thousands, uh, tens of thousands of articles, um, and if you start looking at the internet, I, I suspect that there are probably 100,000 uh, blogs uh, and websites about New York City food. So it is a tremendous field of which um, I've had a great joy of, uh, of doing some writing about, and I have a great joy of uh, reading the material that our panelists have uh, written about it, and um, I look forward to hearing some of their answers to questions, which I've had for a long time, um, and now I have the opportunity to ask them. Uh, we have some bad news and some great news. Uh, the bad news is uh, Molly O'Neill uh, emailed me last night at 11 p.m. Her brother has had a heart attack. He had quadruple bypass surgery. She was with him in the hospital, and she thought that was a good excuse not to come here today in Ohio. So uh, I, I thought that was wonderful I t uh, that, uh, that she was staying with her brother, very sad for the events. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and I you know, want to, uh, I will certainly express my uh, condolences if things don't go as well as she hopes they will. Um, but the good news is at uh, 7 a.m. this morning, Cara De Silva uh, foolishly agreed uh, to come and uh, serve on the panel. Now, I, I have handed out a, a biography of each of our panelists, and so I need not go through everything, but I did want to mention one thing about Kara. I don't even, I don't think you even remember it, but in October of 1994, uh, she was um, a, a food feature editor for the uh, uh, New York uh, Newsday, um, and she came in, 
interviewed me uh, for my first food book, which was uh, Tomato in America. And that was the first interview that I, it was the first interview that I've ever had. I've caused her trouble for 21 years uh, subsequently to that. And this Up morning- to seven o'clock this morning. And <laughs> I've done my share and continue to do that. We're delighted, Kara, that you could uh, join us. Um, uh, as, as, as you can see from the first biography on it, she is, um, one of the features that she did write was on a manuscript from a uh, concentration camp in Germany that women in the concentration camp were writing recipes of things that they remembered. The interview is in Czechoslovakia. With Czechoslovakia, that's close. Um, and so, um, in any case, uh, that was one of the feature articles that she wrote, and it ended up that she edited the manuscript that was published uh, and uh, wrote the introduction to it. And uh, in uh, Memory's Kitchen was uh, a, one of the, uh, a uh, certainly highly recognized and, and well thought of books that came out of that. And I thought that was one of the, uh, of the many things that you did. That to me is one of the wonderful things that you carried out. Uh, Jonathan Deutsch at the end. Uh, Jonathan, um, and I could probably go back at least 15 years, uh, uh, Jonathan uh, was uh, the food arts director and the creator of the food arts program at Kingsborough Community College uh, and was the co-editor of Gastropolis. Um, uh, the correct name for it is Food and Culture in New York City along with Annie Hawk Lawson. And he was the co-writer of Barbecue, uh, a, a global history. Um, and has published uh, several other books. He currently teaches at uh, Drexel University. Uh, William Grimes, um, I've, I've enjoyed your writing for so many years in so many different ways. Somebody stated that uh, you have, in fact, written for, for every department at the New York Times, from book reviews to restaurant reviews to, uh, 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 to ob obits, and uh, is this true or not? I, is it? Uh, maybe not sports, although I've written about horse racing, but not in, horse the, sports, racing. Not in the sports section. <laughs> uh, uh, he is also um, the author of uh, Appetite City, A Culinary History of New York. Uh, it is a series uh, that is also on, um, on educational television. It's available, and it's a wonderful series, which I have actually used in my classroom. So uh, thank you very much for both the book, which I found was wonderful, as well as the series itself. Uh, he's also the uh, author of Straight Up or on the Rocks. <laughs> Uh, Gabrielle Langholz is uh, the editor of Edible Manhattan. Were you also the editor of uh, Edible Brooklyn for a period of time? Uh, she worked um, with the New York City Green Market Office and is the author, as far as I know, the only panelist who actually wrote a cookbook, uh, the New Green Market Cookbook. Is that, is that correct? Uh, and I really look forward to hearing some of your comments, um, and those are wonderful. Now, I had my list of questions, and uh, my first question is, how did each of you get interested in food and writing? Do you That's, want us in order, or does it matter? I'm sorry? Do you want us no, in order? No, any way you want. Go for it, Kara. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. By accident. <laughs> um, I had gone to graduate school and in English literature. I. I uh, was never particularly interested in cooking. I was the kind of kid whose mother said, if you don't learn to cook or about food, you'll never get married, et cetera. And I did get married, and it was then that I learned to cook and about cooking. But beyond that, and maybe because my degrees were in English literature, um, I've always had a bent for writing, and I'm a native New Yorker and extremely passionate about my city and extremely passionate about almost everything concerning it. And of course, one of those things was food. And I was very fortunate in that at that time uh, that I decided I was editing books, cookbooks before that. At the time I decided I wanted to write about food, um, the situation was very different than now. It was still tough, but not like now. Uh, and I immediately caught on at Newsday, New York Newsday, where I had the unbelievable joy and pleasure having the beat um, of covering ethnic New York. And that passion for the city I've never lost. And in fact, I wrote the introduction to this book based in part on the work I did then and the book 
is Gastropolis Food in New York City, uh, edited by John and Annie Hawk Lawson. And that interest has greatly continued. Only now, I would say, I do more food history. Jonathan. I do uh, academic writing which means no one reads it and there's no money. <laughs> and, and you have the pain of peer review. The only person who can make money doing it is Marion Nessel. <laughs> who's sitting um, right here. <laughs> who's sitting right here. Um, I really don't think of myself as a, as a food writer. I, I'm a cooking teacher. Um, and as part of my responsibilities, I need to communicate things about cooking and food and I obviously do that in the classroom with my mouth, and I do that uh, for people who aren't in the classroom with a uh, laptop. And so um, my writing is really in service to um, being a professor of cooking. You know, I always say when I interview prospective students for our culinary um, school, you know, there's, there's two types of, of culinary students are those who learned at the apron strings of, of a parent or a grandparent and have these fond food memories. And there are those who uh, came home from school to an empty house and realized that if they wanted to eat something, they had to figure out how to cook. And I was in, definitely in the latter camp. So, you know, my, anything I do in this field really comes out of um, my insistence on eating what I want to eat and learning how to cook and, um, sort of parlaying that into um, a career in culinary education and thinking and writing and doing uh, about food. Gabrielle? Um, let's see, out of school, um, I got a job at Fortune Magazine and, on the publishing side, on the business side, and um, spent all of my spare time thinking about food, reading about food, hanging out at the farmer's market and cooking. Um, but didn't think of it really as something I could do professionally. And um, then I was on assignment um, for Fortune, on a project for Fortune in Paris for a month. And this was during the dot-com boom and we basically all didn't leave the hotel for a month <laughs> and ate out of the minibar um, every night. And, um, and then on the last day when the project was finished, um, I left and went, I actually had forgotten about this until this morning. Um, and I walked through a farmer's market and had kind of a moment of ecstasy and epiphany and went back to the Georgia Sank Hotel and I think sent a fax to the green market office saying, I need to quit my job and come work for you. Um, and for some reason. And that worked? <laughs> yes, oddly. Um, Are my so, students taking notes out there? Yeah, <laughs> send a fax. Um, don't send a fax. But um, so I went to the green market to my parents' horror, um, <laughs> left my stable job at Time Life, and um, did their marketing, communications, media relations, and grant writing, um, and learned a lot about agriculture and um, had a uh, had a ball, and um, and then when the edible magazines were looking to launch in New York, launched Edible Brooklyn. Um, Brian Hallweil, who many of you may know, emailed me and about the position, and I then forwarded it to a bunch of other people who I thought should apply. And if you wrote back to me and said I should apply, which I hadn't thought about, um, and then I was like, oh yeah, of course I should. So um, I, so here I am. Yeah, I've been at Edible for nine years now, mm -hmm. and uh, it's great fun. Okay, Bill. Thanks. Uh, I think just. Um, at the Times, I was writing a fair amount of travel articles, and strangely enough, the travel, there seemed to be much less emphasis on all the things you're supposed to write in travel, like the museums and uh, the cultural institutions. I kept writing about the food as I moved along whatever route I was traveling. And I think this came to the attention of the fellow who put together the dining section when it was being made into a standalone section in 1997 because he called me up, said, let's have a drink. And he proposed that I write about food full time, which I hadn't really thought about. But I, I said, OK. And that got the ball rolling. And a year and a half later, Ruth Reichel left to become editor of Gourmet. And I wound up taking her job. So it was just, uh, journalism is usually a series of accidents. And this is one of those series. Uh, do, you, do you have any favorite New York City food memory? Dead silence. Have 
to think. Yeah. <laughs> just... oh. Well, you know, since you said it, it's uncanny, but my first visit to New York was also 1960. It was a 10th birthday ritual in my family that you got to go, I grew up around Washington, D.C., you got on the B&O Railroad, went up to New York, and you got to spend a weekend with, there was a, an uncle who uh, worked in advertising, lived near the U.N., and I went to the Automat, and that was my big memory, and it remains my big memory for a variety of reasons, one of which was there was a crusty old guy there. I, you had to ask for the ketchup, and I didn't get why, and this wizened, bent over, fellow uh, said, because the bums take it and they make tomato soup out of it. <laughs> I, if you're 10 years old and you don't live in New York, that goes deep into your brain and it stays there for decades. Carol, you've had time to think. Actually, it's something from my childhood, although I would say the fusing of many cuisines in New York is also very primary. But I have a very strong memory. I grew up in Washington Heights of going out for fried egg sandwiches with my father on Saturday mornings and going to a lunch counter. And I remember everything about it, the crustiness of the egg, the runniness of the egg, the warmth of my father's hand in mine, but also because those kinds of places are gone. You really can't go to them anymore. And it, it was a precious experience, and I think in some odd way, given that it was just an egg sandwich, it was really formative. It made me think about food, even as a little girl. Jonathan? I grew up in Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania, about three, three hours from here. And um, my grandmother, my grandparents were divorced. My grandmother lived in Rego Park, Queens, and uh, I was petrified of New York as a kid. She was an um, Auschwitz survivor, and uh, no nonsense. And I, most of my food memories with her involved looking at the back of her overcoat from about a block away as she ran on 108th Street and Queens Boulevard in and out of stores. And I waddled behind her trying to keep up and see what she was doing. And at the end of all of that, there'd be blintzes. So I'm, that's it. <laughs> Gabrielle? Uh, New York memory or childhood? New, New York. Um, well, can I do something more You can more do recent? childhood. Go for it. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, well, my parents are both um, New Yorkers, but they um, got married and moved to Alaska to raise their family. So my dad's actually a new school graduate. Um, but so as a, in age 4 to 11, I lived in Juneau, Alaska, and all of my food memories, early food memories are from there, where it was this incredible juxtaposition of just really terrible supermarket food, um, like a lot of the Kraft um, green, bright green can of Parmesan. Um, but we ate incredibly well from the wild. We fished all the time, salmon, halibut, you know, go blueberry picking, wearing bear bells. Um, so my my childhood is a is a mix of those like just the worst case scenario 1970s supermarket with uh, splendors of the Alaskan wild <laughs> mixed together. Can I just together. add something quickly? Um, an even stronger memory, and John, in a way, reminded me is that my I wasn't thinking of indoor memories when you asked the question. But I remember that my grandmother had a magical little green enamel pot out of which came kreplach and matzo balls and potted chicken and wonderful onions that were browned, but we would now call them caramelized. I still think of that as the, maybe the best food I've ever had in my life, of being in her apartment in the Bronx with her green pot on the stove and the most extraordinary smells coming out of it without any of the extra spicing or the things we know now or we turn to now. It's just my grandmother and her magical green pot. That's my best food memory of all time. Do uh, any of you have a favorite restaurant memory, uh, one that, uh, a restaurant that may no longer be around? Do any of you have recollections mm -hmm. of, of a restaurant that you really regret is no longer here. Cafe Florent. Uh, when I first moved to New York, which was in 1980, uh, I certainly didn't have, it was a very modest budget I was working with, but there were some restaurants that were, my version of a splurge restaurant, Cator's was one, and Cafe Florent, and 
those two loomed large because they were a real treat and they were quite good and they are quite gone. Okay. When I started at Kingsborough uh, 2001, um, yeah, 2001, um, it was a tourism and hospitality department and they asked me to start a culinary program and uh, there were some hurdles including a total lack of kitchen. Um, <laughs> so we um, held our first classes in Lundy's uh, in Sheepshead Bay, which was sort of transitioning between the old big block Lundy's had closed, they put offices and um, other things in about two thirds of the building and then the remaining one third was a reinvented Lundy's Kitchen with the, some of the same menu and of course much higher prices. And then that subsequently um, failed and is now a gourmet, Russian gourmet market that's actually very good uh, called Cherry Hill or something. Um, but the, that whole area, and, you know, Sheepshead Bay, Manhattan Beach, um, really is, is from what I understand, unrecognizable. Um, and a lot of people really miss that, that sort of anchor restaurant that, that really is, is no more in, any, in those neighborhoods at all. Kara? Actually, um, what comes to my mind is something I just wrote for you about Toffinetti's, which I only became acquainted with uh, shortly before it closed. closed. Um, which was a gigantic restaurant in Times Square. And my parents used to take me to the theater. And I remember going there as a little girl and being completely in awe of the size of it. Even then, I was sensitive to words of the insane, kind of overblown prose on the menu. So it's less about the food itself than it was about this flamboyant, restaurant that it's was so striking to me. It served tens girl. of thousands of people a day. I mean, it was a huge. Yes, it yeah. served 3,000 meals yeah. a day. So yeah, I sick. encourage you to uh, read Appetite City because Tafanetti's is one of my little set pieces in yes, the book. Yes, it is. It was uh, one of the most fascinating restaurant owners ever to arrive in New York. And what he did with menu language was anticipated later developments by many decades. In fact, Bill, I, I mean, I did research beyond that, but Bill is my main reference. And the book we're talking about is Saver and Gotham. Gabrielle? Um, I'll um, pour some out for Queen's Hideaway um, in Greenpoint, which um, for me, gosh, I'm trying to remember when it was in business, probably, if anybody remembers, something like 2001 to 2000 and four or something. Um, and it was just a tiny place that for me really represents, um, in hindsight, a, a real trailblazing in the building of what people call New Brooklyn cuisine now. So it was just um, a young woman um, with a tiny space, like a tiny space and a bunch of tattoos and zero pretension, just really in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, cooking completely from the heart and getting everything from the green market. And, um, and I remember when it got written up in the New York Times, not even a review, just the 25 and under. And my friends and I were like, imagine this little place got, in Brooklyn got written up in the Times dining section, which shows <laughs> how much things have changed. And of course her rent went up and, and she couldn't keep her place. But I really see her of a piece with those early Andrew Tarlow places and um, Zach, when, Zach Palaccio, when he had Chicken Bone, that really kind of blazed the trail to now, of course, Williamsburg is just un, unrecognizable, um, thanks in part to people like, like her. And of course, she now has pot liquor, so she's back, but um, thanks to Liza. I don't hear anybody crying about Mama Leone's. That's, <laughs> a, that's a childhood memory, yeah. Uh, restaurant oh, reviewing has gone through a tremendous change uh, First, uh, the professional restaurant reviewing beginning in the uh, 1950s and in the last 10 years or so, huge shifts and changes. Any comment on restaurant reviewing? I know that not all of you do restaurant reviews, but at least you read them. So uh, any comments on restaurant review and changes that are going on in restaurant reviewing? 
That's a whole topic for a whole panel, yes. really. I mean, that's uh, the world has changed radically since it, the seeds that were just get sprouting when I left the uh, restaurant critic position. But it was the democratizing, leveling effect that the internet was having on food writing in general and uh, reviewing in particular, mm -hmm. because now it's just do it yourself experiencing, reviewing, posting it. Just the, the, the timing of reviews is going to completely, that, that whole protocol has been exploded because now the pictures are on the internet before the Reports restaurant even open. opens its doors. <laughs> is this stamp, Under construction. Stampede, the whole idea of photographing every dish you eat and posting it, getting it up there. It's, um, it's uh, altered the landscape to the point where it's unrecognizable and I think s the traditional outlets for reviewing the traditional role of the critic, all that has changed so much that actually that they're still trying to figure out what to do about it and how to adjust to it and yeah. how to live in this new world. Also, as Mimi Sheraton said last night, um, there is a new trend for the critic not to be anonymous mm -hmm. and that has to change everything very much. If pictures of the critics are available and or if they don't even attempt to disguise themselves so they get presumably fair service. But the anonymity, I don't know, Bill may disagree. I, I think it's always, as a restaurant person and a former cook, you know, I think it's always been such a farce. I'll, I'll just, I went to a dinner with the Philly um, critic who, who does, um, is very um, strict about his anonymity, Craig LeBan, who's a, a Beard nominee this year. Um, we had a lovely dinner. I was there about at the restaurant about 10 minutes before him, and normally I would wait outside, but I really had to pee. So I, um, I ran in, the place was empty, and I said, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm here with his, I can't say it, his pseudonym, but he, he made a reservation under a pseudonym, and I just need to use the restroom and I'll, I'll wait for him. Uh, so I, I did my thing and I came back and the, the manager said, oh, would you like me to seat you now or would you like to wait for Mr. LeBan? And, <laughs> and, he, and then he quickly corrected himself. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, I, you know, I, I see it, um, you know, as, as a cook, if the critic, there's, if the critic is there, you can't order better ingredients, you can't cook better. Of course, the first three months when, when their critical eye is on there, you're gonna be at, you know, make every effort to be at the top of your game anyway. And there's only so much you can do. And, and I've, I've really never worked anywhere where there's been a critic in the house that the entire staff hasn't known about it. Uh, and Mimi mentioned that, that too. Well, she did, except that she felt there was a lot they could do if they knew it if, was you, yeah. whether, but. Well, and they did it. But also what was interesting was that she wasn't always recognized and she told a story of um, having a give, being given a very bad table near the kitchen door and because they didn't know who she was. And she noticed that every time the kitchen door swung open, there was a picture of her on the inside of the kitchen door and still they didn't know yeah, that yeah. she was Hilarious. there. It's a very mixed bag of a thing. I don't think you can keep it up for very, very, very long. I, I want to answer Andy's question um, sort of with my educator hat on, which is, you know, I, I know there are a number of students here. You know, one of the great things is there, there's really no um, state anymore called aspiring food writer. You know, and it's actually one of my, my big frustrations over the years has been, I, I, for many years, I guest lectured once a year uh, in Corinne Trang's uh, food writing course at NYU, and I was, was happy to do it. And when I started, this was you know late 90s, early 2000s, when I started, people would say, I want to get into food writing. How do I break in? And by the end, it was, uh, I was leaving with you know 10 or 15 business cards of everyone's website. And so <clears throat> it, it's, it's wonderful, the opportunity side, which we, you know, we talk about, the, the democratization of it and the ridiculousness of Yelp and, and all of that I think ha has merit, but seen from the, the professional side as, a, as an aspiring writer, it's so refreshing to have 
these few barriers to entry. Anyone can do it. And it, it's really becoming a little bit more of a meritocracy where food writing can be great because there is so much competition that the, the things you actually read are, are worth reading um, rather than the sort of privileged um, access that, that food writers had to have before. Yeah, that's similar to what I was going to say, and you started talking about this, Bill, um, that even, you know, 10 years ago and for so long there were kind of maybe a half dozen reviewers who would kind of put out the word of God and, um, and I remember like, you know, is it Wednesday yet? Every Wednesday, <laughs> the, it's like Christmas morning getting my food section and reading every single story and, um, and now, like you say, the barriers to entry have just been smashed, and um, and anybody with the um, with internet access can Yelp, can tweet, can blog, can change the conversation, can add their voice, which is um, in many ways wonderful for media producers for access to being a, um, having a voice, and. Um, you don't need to go have a job at time in a way, you know, if you do have a job at time, like my best to you, that's hard. And, and as a media consumer, um, it's wonderful and also challenging in that there's now just a fire hose of, of words. There's so much content and, um, and I think that's challenging professionally to um, sell something or make a living at something when it's being given away for free everywhere. So that's a challenge for the Absolutely. industry and we're living through a time of incredibly shifting sands. Absolutely. You're, you're, you're oh, Uncle Bill, go ahead. On the other hand, <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, it strikes me that 90% of it is not worth reading. Mm -hmm. And the 10% that is worth reading, those people in a more robust print culture would find their way into some worthwhile print outlet that probably no longer exists because it's folded. Right. So it's not that you had to, there weren't just five places that you could write about food. There were all sorts of alternative newspapers, um, other, other ways. If you, if you have a distinctive voice and you have something to say, usually you can figure out how to get it said in in some sort of an outlet, even if it's not, you know, a major daily newspaper, and uh, so there's a certain uh, there's a certain bogusness to the argument. And I think there's you need to say more than it sucks or it's awesome, and those seem to be the sort of the two great critical standards on <laughs> of internet restaurant criticism. Two of you have raised this issue already. I plan to cover that a little later. Where's the money in food writing now? Uh, yeah. I think it's a really exciting time to be entrepreneurial. Um, you look at something like Food 52, um, and yeah, so many people, actually Amanda Hesser wrote a really great blog post that I, I would probably just do well to read the whole thing out loud right now, but um, look it up. I think it was um, maybe 2012, and it was about how her advice to young people who for a decade have come to her um, has changed so much in, um, in the really changing opportunities and the increasing scarcity of career food writing jobs, but the incredibly exciting t um, opportunities with entrepreneurialism, which looking at the success and investment in Food 52 is is a great example. I think we'll see more creative models like that, but I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to learning about them myself. Okay. I think, I mean, it's obviously, it's a very difficult time for aspiring food writers. Um, I know a number of people who work at other jobs in order to be able to work in food because yeah. they can't make money in food, including some fairly well-known people uh, I don't know who in the audience is thinking of food writing as a career, but it will be a bitch to make a living at it. And it would not be a bad thing to think of other correlative things that might help you en route. On the other hand, I think to some degree it's a waiting game. Um, if you have the time to wait and to teach yourself and to learn more about food writing while you're doing it. Um, Food is so powerful as a subject. 
it's never going to stop being written about. People are never going to want to not read about it. If there are new ways, if you can think of new ways to do it, if you can wait till the current situation sorts out electronically in other ways, or maybe some of the people blogging and writing um, don't want to do it anymore, or some have just dropped out because people aren't responsive to what they're doing. I think ultimately there will be work of some kind, at least for many, but this is a very, very, very difficult time because it's a shakeout. Nobody knows what's happening and not many people are paying and they can pay less also because there are so many people wanting to do the work. So that, I mean, I think it's, but I think, as Bill does, I think it has a good side and a bad side. And as I said, I can only say, and I say it with great passion, that um, the subject of food will, and restaurants and places to eat is never going away, never. Yeah. And you will always be able to create out of that and hopefully perhaps new things that will catch on. I may be a little bit more optimistic. Um, I, I think I know how to make money, but I can't do it because I don't have the skills. But the, the people who really understand SEO and getting eyeballs on web yes. can figure out the right pitch that is not strictly a content pitch of this is something that would be interesting and fascinating. So I, I, I'll give you an example. I have a weekly column I've had for about four years in Restaurant Business Magazine, which is a trade publication, goes to restaurant owners. Um, I pitched it and they said, well, well, we won't pay you, but give us four columns, we'll put them up, and if people read it and we can sell more ads, we'll start paying you. And it worked. And I think I'm fortunate to have a, a day job because uh, exactly. my, you know, my, my four-figure uh, writing income that probably can't, can't support your, your, anyone. Your two-figure writing right? income? Is that <laughs> yeah, right. So, but um, it's a model that had I um, focused on, I think, could have accelerated. And, and I think it's one of the um, easy traps to get into. It's, it's sort of like cooking. Just because you don't like something, you know, from a certain cuisine or a certain style or a certain ingredient, doesn't mean you can't make money with it and a lot of other people would need it, right? So, you know, just because you read the Times and the New Yorker, and, you know, there's a big world out there of, of food media, some of which the, the typical consumer has no access to in terms, you know, there's a trade magazine for pizza shop owners and for bakers and for food processing and for all these fields and subfields and specialties in the in the trades and also you know for general consumers so um, I think it's uh, it's easy to just say oh there's there's not that much happening if, if you just look at your newsstand but you know dig deeper and it, it's I interesting. I think to some degree it depends on what kind of food writing you want to do John is a hundred percent correct if that's also acceptable to you as food writing if you want to do something that you think of as more glamorous or with more of you in it, that's another story. Mm -hmm. But if you can do what he does, and for even with his second job, if you can figure out a way to make money in the food industry in a way that doesn't fill up your heart, but that gets you closer to what you might want to do ultimately, where you meet more people, that's a good thing. Bill? Yeah, the paradox here is, is, has there ever been a time in American history when the appetite has been keener right. and the, the uh, th thirst so great demand. for this subject? That is a market. And you, you, this, is a, this problem goes beyond food writing. It's a sort of a general journalism problem that all these journalism schools are wrestling with is how, where is the market at what, what's your point of access to it and, and where is the money for you personally, which is everybody's trying to crack that problem. Yeah, if you think about it in terms of supply and demand, the demand for food writing, food storytelling has never been greater, mm -hmm. but the supply is so huge right. now too. 
What's the future of cookbooks? What's what? What's the future of cookbooks? Um, I wish I knew, but um, I'll, I'll um, reference a Venn diagram that maybe everybody in the room has seen, um, and it was um, people who think print is dead and people with book deals, and in the middle was bloggers. So I think that's a big um, future is, and that, and that gets to what you were saying about you know, people giving you their business card and saying, here's my, here's my blog, that, um, that so many of cookbooks grow out of blogs that individuals built into successes with big followings, and I think publishers feel confident when they see a big following, oh, that book will sell. But long term, I don't know how long we'll cut down trees to tell these stories. I mean, I think people love to hold something in their hand, whether it's a cookbook or a copy of the New York Times or a magazine. Um, I think we will eventually stop cutting down trees to tell those stories. Other comments? I think, you know, you, you, we've all, I think maybe to some extent we're at the future of cookbooks in that um, having a brilliant idea for a recipe or a brilliant technique for a recipe is, is irrelevant at this point, right? No one, you know, and I, and I find this myself, if I, if I wanna learn how to cook something or get, get a basic recipe in mind, I don't rush to a cookbook, I go to the internet. If I wanna see, understand a chef or a, a, an entrepreneur or someone's philosophy about food and their underpinning, you know, and, and the big picture of how they think and how they express themselves through food, then I go to that cookbook. And I, I think um, that shift has already happened. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking of um, books that are really, with, books with recipes that you really do sit down and read, you know, like Mark Fetterman's um, Russ and Daughters book, which you could argue is maybe a cookbook, but has more um, narrative than recipes. And I, I think, we're already starting to see a lot more of that, whether it's narrative, photos, you know, um, <coughs> pictures of the farms and the fishermen and where the food is coming from. You know, it's, it's really about the storytelling and the recipes are, are sort of in service to that. I think it's also really about the photography in, increasingly, or in many books, that, mm. um, that so much of it is about um, not just what is something good that I can make for dinner, but mm -hmm. what is a kind of whole immersive aspirational <coughs> experience that, mm -hmm. that when I hold this thing and page through it, um, it's like a brain spa, like, wow, this, this is, could be my life. Um, I think that's, that's a yeah. big reason that people buy and give yeah. those books. I think so too. Future of food blogging. Future of food blogging, yeah. Or video, you know. I think I, as a mm -hmm. as a teacher, recipes are just about the least efficient way of teaching someone how to do something. Right? You have this double abstraction. I can cook something. I write it down, simplifying it, making making it, you know, um, translating it, and then the reader has to interpret that. There's so much room for error. Um, so you know, I think we're already. Um, well on the way to just more multimedia blogs in every, in every sense and, and um, really even bypassing, you know, the, the blog as we know it and going right to a YouTube channel. I mean, I think you see that everywhere. And it, um, I'm not quite keeping up with it. But if I mention a term or a technique that, um, that the students don't immediately grasp, they're looking they're looking on YouTube before I finish talking. And the, the, for them to think about reading something about how to do something is just a ridiculous notion. <laughs> it's funny because that takes us full circle in a way. If you've ever read Jacques Pepin's memoir, uh, The Apprentice, and he describes how he was trained, it was a version of what you're talking about. You'd stand next to a guy at the yeah, stove yeah. and watch his hands, yeah. and this, Technology. Yep, yep. His first big cookbooks, in fact, were an attempt to kind of recreate that through still photographs, with very detailed one photograph for each possible mm -hmm. little tiny step yeah, yeah. in the production. And this is the next logical point at which you can just. I mean, I do this for you know changing a part of my car. Right. And right. I don't see the difference. You know. 
in terms of how to, yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, I, this isn't food blogging, but um, I feel really excited about audio. Um, I feel like we all spend so much time looking at screens and there's, like I said, just a fire hose of endless information. You could never have it all enter your eyeballs or even 1% of 1%. Um, but I feel that there's an unmet demand for great audio. I'm a real podcast junkie. Um, I spend hours a week, sometimes hours a day, multitasking. I mean, you can't multitask while you're reading something, or not very well. Um, but all the time, I'm whether I'm chopping an onion or walking down the street or um, fill in the blank, I'm listening. Um, and there are some great podcasts out there. I think it's a really exciting space that is not crazy crowded right now the way mm -hmm. blogs are. Um, I love, um, uh, anyway, I love a bunch of them. Um, and, and the barriers to entry aren't as low as tweeting, but, um, but anyone can do it. And I, I, see a, um, I see opportunities there, and I feel really excited about, about the future there. Gabrielle, are these recipes that are being No, I don't about? mean recipes. I mean people certainly um, some of them include like here's how to make blah blah blah. But um, storytelling um, report I mean I love um, gravy podcast done by um, Southern Foodways. I mean they'll tell 45 minutes. It's, it's kind of like this American life kind of just really well produced, edited, compelling, captivating storytelling about some chef in North Carolina who has a huge collection of rock concert t-shirts that you just can't take your earbuds out. Um, or <laughs> believe me, that was a really good one. Or um, KCRW in LA, they have um, you know, a weekly hour long one called Good Food. BBC does a great one, food program, and they'll go deep on an individual subject. And sometimes they'll spend time with the chef and talk about a specific technique. But it's, um, it's the great kind of storytelling that um, we're used to reading that you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I'm not sure how much the metric is for audio, but it's worth a lot. And I, and I see a big future there that I'm excited about. We want to open it up to questions or comments the students particularly, but all of you in the audience may have. So feel free to come up to either side and do that. While, while somebody is trying to think of what they would like to ask, I have 10 more questions. Um, so question number one, what's uh, in your future for food writing? Do you, do you have anything in in store, anything you're working on? I am. <laughs> but I just, um, I'm very involved with uh, things in Venice and as in Italy. And it's about to be the f next year, the 500th anniversary of the Jewish ghetto, which is an enormous thing historically. It was the first ghetto in the world created by a government. It's what the word comes from. But one of the other things about it is what went on in terms of food within the ghetto, um, even despite kosher laws and other such restrictions. It was really phenomenal. And um, in fact, it was said it has been said by scholars that food within the ghetto in Venice was actually much more various and interesting than the food in Venice itself. So I am part of the ghetto celebrations and one of the things I'm gonna do is both lecture about what I just said, um, but also write about it because his, I'm very, I've become extremely interested in food history from New York out and um, it's a project I'm really, really, really looking forward to doing um, with a great deal of passion. New York and Venice are my cities. Jonathan? Andy's very modest, but we just finished a project, Kara, Kathy, uh, a number of people in the room, uh, called Savor in Gotham, which is coming out from Oxford University Press on uh, food in New York. Um, I thought of something else for aspiring food writers. What I'm mostly writing uh, on deadline is um, you know, curriculum, um, which is a whole other area that you can actually make money doing um, for New York City Health Department. Um, and then uh, I, I wrote a book um, a few years ago, or edited a book called They Eat That, um, which was 
sort of uh, reference book of interesting foods from around the world, and there's a U.S. version uh, coming out in a year or so. Okay. So uh, also for students who, or anyone who, but especially students who want to get, it, it's um, once you start being published, it's easier to say, this is what I've done, and I can do more. Um, so it's a good sort of uh, entry point to write for that. So I'm happy to chat with you. Gabrielle? Um, so what's next for us? What are we working on? Um, I have a um, next book in the works that I'm really excited about, about um, regional American cuisine, which is why I need to buy your um, American Food Oxford book. Mm -hmm. um, saving up for that. Um, uh, but Edible is continuing to grow and do great things. I'm working on our innovation issue right now. And um, follow us, read us. Uh, always more there. Bill? I'm sort of an underachiever. I just got... Uh, <laughs> I just Hardly. That's the delivery of the, the Oxford Companion to Sugar and Sweets just came out. I wrote the New York part of that. And that's about all I've done lately. I don't really have anything cooking right now on the food writing front. Okay. I'm working on something else. Question. Um, oh, there we go. Hi. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. This is delicious and elucidating. I'm Laura Silver, author of Kanish, In Search of the Jewish Soul Hello. Food, and as you probably guessed, a native New Yorker. Um, riffing on a topic we were talking about yesterday, hunger, I wanted to ask you, to what extent, if at all, do you see it as a responsibility or role of uh, someone writing about food or reviewing restaurants to address issues of hunger and inequity? Because as was brought up, hunger is never just about food. And food is never just about food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I feel at Edible, um, like a big part of what we cover is how food choices um, shape our world. And um, in terms of public health, hunger, ecology. Um, so I find it an exciting challenge to tell those stories in a way that people want to read, to kind of spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down kind of thing. I, f I, my personal balancing act there is I feel like if we just come out and cover heavy, unhappy topics, then we'll be less effective because we'll have fewer readers. So I'm always, don't tell anybody, looking for ways to kind of slip, slip the important stuff in while keeping a big audience. That's, that's the balancing act. But I it's incredi important, incredibly important work, yeah. I just tend to work, talk about it privately. It really doesn't, there's no way in which I could normally work that into my writing, but I'm very aware of it and I try to talk about it. It's just who I am, a native New Yorker and a writer to make sure that people stay aware. There were some incredibly shocking statistics about the situation in New York at a, on a panel yesterday, and uh, I don't go around quoting statistics, but I try to make sure people realize who their neighbors are mm -hmm. and what's happening in the city and the degree to which we are not meeting our responsibilities to the hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be very difficult, as Gabrielle said, to, to be doing that. Yeah. I mean, I'm already doing the Holocaust, and. Um, talk about starvation almost all the time. It's an add-on in a very different circumstance. Can, can I just say something else not related to what we're talking about, but... Hold it one after. second, let's, sure. let's focus on this and then we can do it. I just wanted to add, um, I think it's absolutely important, um, especially when, when we talk about um, New York. I was, I was with a colleague um, yesterday for, for Mimi's talk, who's from Arizona. And uh, Mimi was talking and doing her thing, and she said, "God, is everyone in New York Jewish?" And <laughs> and um, you you forget about the diversity of New York if you stay in in a privileged circle of whatever group. Um, we were really um, honored. I see her in the fifth row in Gastropolis. Um, Jan Papendiek and uh, J C Dwyer um, wrote a chapter called "Hungry City" because that's you know, if you talk about food in New York, you have to talk about food and lack of food and food insecurity. Um, you know, sort of, as Gabrielle said, 
you can't do, you can't beat people over the head with it all the time, but I think it's, it's a key part of the story. Another question, a bill? You? Yeah. No, that's a, okay, another question. That, that question came before me. Hi, my name's Lynn Ripley. I've, a question that I have has to do uh, with actually one of the topics from yesterday too, and that had to do with the nexus of rural or food shed versus a city. Yeah. I grew up on a farm. I lived in New York City for the last 30 years. So I know both sides. I was appalled yesterday of how few people stayed for the panel on the rural parts of the food shed. And um, I'm wondering whether you guys think that more writing in this area that was more compelling with respect to personal stories uh, would make learning more about the rural side of things easier for New Yorkers. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next question. No. <laughs> yeah. Good question. All right. Anybody? We do a lot of farmer profiles in Edible. Um, it's, it's, you know, bread and butter for us. Um, and my book includes a bunch of 20 farmer profiles. But, um, but I know that they are um, not commodity farmers. The kinds of stories that we tell are very often um, oh, this person used to live in Williamsburg and now she raises goats and sells goat cheese at the green market. And it's very different from telling a story of, oh, this person has, you know, 300 cows and she's a seventh generation dairy farmer and she's not certified organic. Um, there's a woman on Twitter, do you know NY Farmer, Lorraine Landowski? She, t she tweets about this a lot and t has a lot of criticism for the kind of um, New York urban ivory tower storytelling. Um, but I, I struggle with how to make that story compelling. Maybe I'll come and pick your brain after this to get your ideas um, for the urban reader. I mean, I, <laughs> great, okay, we'll talk, yeah. Other comments? Another question? My name is Mary Denise Smith and I am a copy editor and a proofreader for, wait for it, Food bloggers. Wow. So the question that I have for you is not about raising the entry bar for people who envision themselves as food writers, but raising the survival bar. Who is the judge of whether a food writer, because they're defining themselves as food writers, survives? Is it the readership? who demands access to ethnic writing? Is it the readership that demands a reasonably gra grammatically correct and correctly spelled work? Is it the professional readership who says, your amateur writing should be looking to push itself up to the level of food literature? I don't understand the question. It's who, who or what determines success? Who's, who's in charge of raising the bar for the thousands of bloggers out there who are writing really good stuff and stuff that the delete button is the only option? Nobody's in charge. Is that, exactly. I would it's think. capitalism. You know, um, <laughs> if, if you're selling, if you are a seller, you need a buyer. Yeah. And the buyer determines whether you know, they make, you make those little choices. Are you voting with your feet or with your wallet? Yes, I like this. No, I don't like that. And it may be turning, clicking on the TV or clicking on the mouse at your computer. But a million, billion, trillion decisions like that are made every nanosecond. Um, yes, I like this. I want more. No, I don't like this. I'm moving to the next thing. What I didn't say before that I think is somewhat relevant to what you're talking about is that it's not just a question of publishing your blog because you are subject to the forces of a marketplace which at the moment are overwhelming and confusing and 
very hard to make your way through, but I think it's very, very important for bloggers, writers, for anybody to learn to manage the marketplace and how to market yourself and how to pitch. And I think that's one of the most important things. Where you learn it, how you learn it, is another story. But an instinct for it could easily make a blog that say medium level rise above something that's of a higher level if we're going to rate them. Uh, simply because the first blogger knows better how to promote what she's doing and she has to have, or he's doing, they have to have a very clear idea of what they're doing and of how to get it out there, whether it's with social media or through contacts that are made on social media. Um, get to editors, get to, you know, post on the pages of um, things that are already on the internet. Try to be as, maybe that's a prescription for disaster, but try to be as distinctive as you possibly can so you're not one of a billion people. And unfortunately, a great deal of this is luck. This, that part I'm talking about is the part you can do yourself. You can write as well as possible about something really interesting and be careful to, spelling is oddly very important. Um, grammar, et cetera, it really takes you down if you're publishing things with misspellings and other things in them. But um, extremely, extremely important to learn to negotiate your way through the world we're living in now in a variety of, I'm happy to talk to anybody privately, but um, it's not a small thing I'm saying, it's a very big part of success. In print, your, in print world, there used to be people in charge and they were called editors and they would help writers yes. who were trying to say something but just weren't quite getting to it or they had a personality and a voice but they weren't articulating it and brilliant editors were always able to coax the performance in the way that a director would in the theater. They were able to coax the performance out of a writer. Look at, um, I mean, the story of To Kill a Mockingbird is really sort of this, the last century's most dramatic example of a writer who had a genuine but rather unformed talent who didn't know quite what to do with this mass of material and very good editors were able to take her and take her material and form it into something that you know, sold a billion copies and changed the world. Uh, I don't think, there, is there such a thing as a blog coach, for example? Well, Molly O'Neill is. And I want to mention that because she's not here. But um, she actually t does teach classes in food writing and blogging. Um, she does it online. Um, and whether you want to do that, I'm sure she's not the only one, but she's very powerful, um, I think, from what I hear from her students and very helpful, and there must be other people out there doing things like that. It's worth investigating. Uh, Karen and Bill have already moved into my final question, which is what advice would you have for anybody who would like to get into food writing? Do stuff so that you know stuff, so that you'll have smart stuff to say, like go out and get your hands dirty and um, really know your subject and report, really um, be a reporter. A lot of the work of food writing does not happen like this. This, hap this is really important too, but you have to go out there first before you have things to do this about. Jonathan? Something I didn't say before was I still hear people say, I want to be a food writer, which I think is ridiculous. They should just be, everyone who wants to should do it. Um, the other thing is I've had increasingly in my classes, which are geared for people who want to be chefs or restaurant owners, restaurant managers, a number of people who've said, I'm a writer, I want to get into food writing, and I don't want to be someone who opines about food who can't do the real thing. And so they go to culinary school, they work in restaurants, and then or in parallel to the writing. And I really respect that. I'm, I'm not sure it's a requirement, um, but I think it adds nuance that, and, and 
um, some credibility that um, some writers lack who, who haven't really paid their dues in the profession. Thank you very much. You were fantastic. Thank you.